Danmin, a figure of great controversy in history, was scorned by his enemies as the son of a slave, yet he usurped the throne of later Zhao to eliminate opposition, he ordered the execution of 200,000 enemies. Some accuse him of brutal and inhumane slaughter, while others argue he was enacting divine justice. During the period of the Five Barbarians' Chaos, the Han people faced a nightmarish existence. The barbarians, regardless of their status as nobles or commoners, killed at will, treating the Han as mere playthings, defined as a two-legged sheep, and literally putting them on their tables as food. The constant warfare and frequent killings by the barbarians caused the population of the northern Han people to plummet from over 20 million to just over 4 million. Without Ramin intervention to dramatically alter the course of events and save the Han from extinction, it's conceivable that Chinese civilization might have ended then. How should we, 1700 years later, view this history? In this video, we will explore the life of Ranmin. Ranmin's ancestral home was in Neiwen County, Wei Commandery. At the end of the Western Jin period, amidst the chaos caused by the five barbarians, the central plains were scattered with people fleeing for their lives. Ranmin's father, Ran Zhan, joined the army of later Zhao to survive and was captured by Shi Lu, the heavenly king of later Zhao, after defeating Chen Wu. Shulu then had Ranmin adopted by the heavenly king Shuhu. Ranmin, from a young age, demonstrated decisive and keen qualities. Shuhu, deeply fond of him, raised him with the same affection he had for his own grandsons. Upon reaching adulthood, Ranmin grew to be eight feet tall, excelling in bravery and skilled in warfare, with strength surpassing others and endowed with numerous stratagems. He was appointed as the general who establishes valor and later ennobled as Marquis of Xiucheng, serving successively as the general of the Central and Interior Guards and the general of Rapid Strike. In the year 338, during the Battle of Changli, Xu Hu suffered a major defeat, and the forces of later Zhao turned into a disordered retreat, discarding their armor in their flight. Only the army led by Ramin remained unscathed, thereby greatly enhancing Ramin's reputation and prestige. Both Hu and Han generals held immense respect and fear for Ranmi. After Shi Le's death, Shi Hu seized the throne, eliminating Shi Le's descendants entirely. As Shi Hu adopted grandson, Ranmi's status rose significantly, catapulting him directly into the core circle of later Zhao's elite, where he would play a pivotal role in shaking the foundations of the regime. What was the situation in later Zhao at the time? The period of the Five Barbarians wreaking havoc was an unprecedented dark age in Chinese history, marked by brutal rule by foreign Hu regimes. They committed mass killings and relentless conquests, bringing profound suffering to the innocent Han populace. Among them, Shi Hu and his sons from later Zhao, of Jiehu origin, were particularly notorious. Following his usurpation, Shi Hu brutally conscripted Han people as slaves for his construction projects, from Chang'an to Luoyang, with Han corpses hanging from trees along the route. Shi Hu's son, Shi Zun, surpassed his father in cruelty, not only raping officials' wives and daughters, but also beheading beautiful concubines and displaying their heads, even killing nuns to eat their flesh cooked with beef and mutton, challenging his courtiers to distinguish between beef and human flesh. Such brutality is unparalleled in the annals of Chinese history. Shi Hu was ruthless not just towards the Han but also towards his own family. After a fallout with his son Shi Sui, Shi Hu killed him and his entire family of 26, burying them in a single coffin. Later Shi Hu reinstated another son, Shi Xuan, as crown prince, who also opposed him, leading Shi Hu to annihilate Shi Xuan family as well. After executing two sons, Shi Hu appointed his ten-year-old son Shi Shi as crown prince, sowing the seeds of internal strife within later Zhao. What was Ramin doing at this time? He was waging war against the Eastern Jin. In 339, Shi Hu, along with his son Shi Tian and adopted grandson Ramin, launched an attack on the Eastern Jin's Zhu city. When the Eastern Jin state uncle, Yu Liang, received a plea for help from Zhu City, he ignored it, resulting in Zhu's fall and the death of 6,000 soldiers. Ranmin's significant defeat of Jin forces in this battle marked the beginning of his enmity with the Eastern Jin. After Shi Hu's death in 349 AD, the young crown prince Shi Shu ascended the throne, with Empress Dowager Lu and Prime Minister Zhang Chai monopolizing power, plunging later Zhao into chaos. Shi Hu had favored his son Shi Zun and Shi Bin, who were older and more powerful than Shi Shi. 
To eliminate potential threats, Empress Dowager Lu issued a false imperial decree to kill Shi Bin and appease Chizun by making him the king of Hengcheng. As a general of later Zhao, Ramin strongly urged Chizun to march back to the capital, Yi, and seize power. Chizun, pleased with the suggestion, promised Jianmin he would make him the crown prince upon success. This promise, unbeknownst to them, would lead to a bloody conflict and widespread carnage. With a force of 90,000 troops and Admin leading the vanguard, they marched towards Yi with overwhelming momentum. Empress Dowager Lu and Zhang Chai, unable to resist, surrendered the city. Shizun usurped the throne, appointed Admin as the Grand General overseeing all military affairs and assisting in government, and named his brother Shibin Sun Shiyan as the Crown Prince, much to Admin's disappointment. Given their relation, both Ramin and Shi Yan were Shizun nephews, but Ramin, not being a direct descendant of the Shi family and despite his role in elevating Shizun, was considered inferior to Shi Hu's true grandson Shi Yan. This created a rift between Ramin and Shizun, with Ramin seeking to consolidate power in the court and sideline Shizun. Shizun, growing discontented with Ramin, conspired with his brother Shi Jian to strip Ramin of his power. Unbeknownst to Shi Zun, Shi Jian revealed the plot to Ran Min. Ran Min, in response, launched an attack, killed Shi Bin, and installed Shi Jian as the emperor. Despite his titles, Ran Min was considered an outsider in terms of bloodline. His actions of deposing and installing emperors as if they were his possessions angered the royal family of later Zhao, including Emperor Shi Jian. Then, how would Ran Min respond to the challenges from the royal family of later Zhao? Not long after, Shi Jian sent assassins to kill Ran Min, but not only did the attempt fail, it also caused unrest within the palace. To prevent Ran Min from discovering that he was behind the plot, Shi Jian had no choice but to painfully kill the participants, including his own younger brother Shi Bao. Following this, Shi Zhi, another brother of Shi Jian, assembled a large army to attack Ran Min. Members of the later Zhao royal family who stayed in Yecheng, along with several others, also attempted to assassinate Ran Min but were defeated by him. As we can see above, Ran Min's foundation of power was quite weak, and the clan of later Zhao all disliked him and attacked him, and it even happened that some people wanted to hold Shi Jian, the son of heaven, hostage to crush Ran Min. In order to root out the trouble, Ran Min led thousands of men and horses to storm the palace, imprison Shi Jian, and hang the rebels. This coup killed the palace with blood and corpses, and the Hu people in the city fled. Ran Min was aware that these Hu people would not submit to his rule, recognizing only the descendants of Shi Hu as their rulers. Although he was a foster grandson of Shi Hu, in the eyes of the Jie Hu people, he was ultimately still a Han. Therefore, Ran Min issued one of the most controversial orders in history, the order to kill the Hu, decreeing that all, regardless of status, gender, or age, should be killed. This unprecedented action led to the deaths of over 200,000 people, including many Han who had assimilated into the Hu culture. Their bodies were piled up outside the city, unattended and left to be consumed by wild dogs and wolves. This order to kill the Hu has been the subject of mixed evaluations throughout history. Firstly, the rule of the Shi family of later Zhao was extremely brutal, causing the people of Zhongyuan to live in sorrow, and ethnic tensions were very severe. This was the realistic foundation for Ran Min's initiation of the order to kill the Hu people. Secondly, Ran Min's identity was quite awkward. Although he was a foster grandson of Shi Hu and of Han lineage, in the eyes of the Jie Hu people, he was considered an outsider whose heart must differ. However, to the Han people of Zhongyuan, Ran Min was no different from those Hu people. Caught in such an unfavorable situation from both sides, Ran Min chose to massacre the Jiehu people and eradicate all opposing forces, hoping to gain the recognition of the northern Han people and establish his own foundation for rule. So, could Ran Min's plan be realized? The year after issuing the order to kill the Hu, which was in 350 AD, Ran Min ascended the throne, claiming the title of emperor, restoring his family name to Ran, and naming his dynasty Da Wei, historically known as Ran Wei. 38 descendants of Shi Hu were killed by Ran Min. Although Ran Min deeply despised the Jie Hu people, the regime he established still bore a strong Hu influence. Politically, he implemented a system of separate governance for the Hu and Han people and militarily, he retained the tribal military system. Even Ran Min's son was titled as the Great Chinese. Such a state of Ran Wei formed a stark contrast with the cultured and scholarly Eastern Jin dynasty of the time. 
Lack of legitimacy was the biggest problem that he faced. Neither domestically nor internationally did anyone want to recognize the Ranwei regime. So, how could Amin solve this problem? Not long after declaring himself emperor, Shi Zhi, a son of Shi Hu, also proclaimed himself emperor of Da Zhao and rebelled, with various regions responding to his call. The newly established Ranwei regime immediately fell into a situation of widespread internal strife. Yan Min sent envoys to the Eastern Jin for help, but his words greatly annoyed the Eastern Jin court. He claimed to have pacified the chaos caused by the Hu people in the Central Plains and suggested that if the Eastern Jin wished to join him in quelling the rebellion, they could send troops to assist him. Implicitly, he sought to be regarded on equal footing with the Eastern Jin Emperor, a notion that was preposterous to the Eastern Jin court. The Eastern Jin had always considered itself the legitimate successor of the Chinese tradition, following the Han, Cao Wei, and Western Jin dynasties. It did not recognize any regime in the Central Plains, whether Hu or Han. Therefore, the Eastern Jin did not send aid to Ranwei but instead attacked Ranwei, Huifei, relocating thousands of local families. Being Han themselves, the Eastern Jin was not a reliable ally for Ranmin. How then could Ranmin respond to actual attacks? In 351 AD, Ranmin led an army of 100,000 to attack Shi Zhi's stronghold in Xiangguo, besieging it for over a hundred days with heavy casualties. The newly acknowledged Yan King by the Eastern Jin, the Xianbei leader Mu Rongjun, sent troops to rescue Shi Zhi, with the three forces together numbering over a hundred thousand. Yanmin suffered a significant defeat and fled back to Yecheng. Ironically, Mu Rongjun, a Xianbei, received recognition from the Eastern Jin and attacked Ran Wei with the title of Yan King granted by the Eastern Jin. Although Ranmin was Han, he did not gain recognition from the Eastern Jin, also Han. Why did the Eastern Jin act this way? As mentioned earlier, the Eastern Jin considered itself the legitimate continuation of Chinese civilization and did not recognize any northern regimes. However, if Northern Hu leaders were willing to submit to the Eastern Jin nominally, the Eastern Jin was very willing to confer official titles and ranks on them. Yan Min claimed to the throne and his attempt to be seen as equal to the Eastern Jin challenged the legitimacy of the Eastern Jin's foundation. Since the Eastern Jin was the sole legitimate successor of Chinese civilization, it could maintain its moral high ground, attracting refugees from the noble families that had moved south, thereby securing its base south of the Yangtze River and providing a legal justification for its future campaigns to reconquer the Central Plains. Yan Min positioning himself as the legitimate Han ruler in the Central Plains fundamentally challenged the legal authority of the Eastern Jin. If the Eastern Jin recognized Yan Min as emperor, would their future northern expeditions to the Central Plains be considered as reclaiming lost territory or invading another country? Therefore, the simple ethnic solidarity among Han people was far less important than ensuring their own foundation of rule. Thus, the Eastern Jin preferred to support a Hu leader who submitted to them rather than a Han emperor like Yan Min who sought to be their equal. However, the greatest tragedy for Yan Mian was that although he had the ambition to be an emperor, he lacked the ability to pacify rival lords. After retreating to Yecheng, Yan Mian managed to eliminate Shi Zhi but could no longer counter the major offensives of the Murong clan. Desperate and on the run, Yan Mian was eventually captured by Mu Rongke after fleeing alone for more than 20 miles. Mu Rongjun confronted Yan Mian, asking, You servant and lowborn, why did you presumptuously claim to be the son of heaven? Yan Min replied, in such chaotic times, when your barbarian tribes, with the faces of men but hearts of beasts, still aspire to usurp and rebel, why can I not be an emperor, being a hero of my age? Enraged, Mu Rongjun had Yan Min flogged 300 times and sent to Longcheng, where he was beheaded. After Yan Min's death, the vegetation withered for miles around, and it did not rain for five consecutive months. Mu Rongke hastily arranged sacrifices for Yan Min and posthumously honored him as the martial mourning heavenly king. Yan Min's failure can be attributed to several reasons. First, his lack of legitimate authority made it difficult to gain widespread support. Although Yan Min was a general of later Zhao and received the nurturing of Shi Hu, he incited infighting among Shi Hu descendants and then deposed two emperors to ascend the throne himself. Both Han and Hu people viewed him as a treacherous and unfilial subject. Secondly, Yan Min was obstinate and ignored advice. 
Guanglu Daifu Weixiao, coming from a Han scholarly family, was highly respected for his Confucian learning even during the later Zhao period. After Ranmin accession, Weixiao advised Ranmin but was executed along with his entire family, leading Ranmin to lose the support of the Han scholarly families. Thirdly, challenging the legal authority of the Eastern Jin led to enemies on all sides. Although later Zhao's rule was brutal, it had been established for decades and still had significant influence in the Central Plains. Ranmin, as the foster grandson of Shu Hu, seized power but ascended the throne as a Han, inheriting neither the legal authority of later Zhao nor establishing his own. With the more legitimate Eastern Jin existing, Ranmin, even after killing 200,000 Tiehu, could not gain the recognition of his Han brethren and instead faced enemies on all sides, ultimately leading to his demise. Was Ranmin order to kill the Hu truly meaningless? The subsequent former Qin regime learned from the downfall of later Zhao and avoided the brutal rule characteristic of Shu Hu and his sons, opting for a more temperate governance. How much of a warning role did Ranmin order to kill the Hu play in this? This period of history leaves endless room for reflection. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe to the comments, your support is my motivation to create.